Thank you. Well, good morning. It's so nice to be here. I heard there was a vicious rumor going around that I didn't make it out of New York City because of the weather. So I'm so glad the volunteers actually believe this was me and that I'm here sharing this story with you this morning. Um, I love great American stories. And I love beehives. And um, a combination of those two things, as you will learn, led me to tell this amazing um, but looked over American story of our original astronaut wives. So I want to bring you back to 1959. April 9th, there was a press conference in Washington, DC. And the whole country is riveted and waiting for the announcement of the Mercury 7 astronauts. It's the height of the Cold War, and we're looking to these seven men, Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Alan Shepard among them, as our Cold War warriors, these silver-suited spacemen who are going to take us to the stars and beyond. So you have all of these macho test pilots sitting up on a stage, and uh, something peculiar starts happening. The reporters are raising their hands, and instead of asking, uh, you know, tell us about your bravery, about why you wanted to volunteer, the reporters want to hear, what does your wife think about this? She's going to let you be catapulted into space. And so there's this immediate attention to the wives of these men. And um, I want to tell you about some of the women. Um, there's Reen Carpenter, who is this dishy blonde. She's sort of the Marilyn Monroe of the space age. She wakes up in um, Garden Grove, California, early in the morning and sees these headlights hovering in her yard. Is it a UFO? What is that? No, they're reporters who've come to interview her about what it's going to be like to be one of the wives of these spacemen. I mean, it's almost science fiction. Reporters can't believe it. And Reen, who wanted to be an actress in high school, she opens the door, offers the reporters coffee. Some of them have brought donuts, and they start taking pictures of her and her family as they're sort of crawling all over her. And she's a real dish. JFK would later say he found her the most attractive of all of the astronaut wives. Because, of course, as they're going to learn, they're going to quickly go through this Cinderella-like transformation. Now, out in um, Ohio, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Betty Grissom, Gus Grissom's wife, just received a phone call the night before from her husband. He said, you know, you, you might want to straighten up the house a bit, Bets. You know, uh, some reporters might be coming tomorrow. And she looks around. The house is a mess. She's just getting over the flu. She feels terrible, but somehow pulls it together, goes to the doctor the next morning. And as she's stopping at a grocery store on her way home, two reporters from Life magazine encounter her in the vegetable aisle and want to know what she thinks about old Gus going into space. You know, she just wants them to leave her alone. Of course, they follow her home. She's sort of the shrinking violet of the group, um, very down-to-earth folksy. Um, she always um, repeated a quote of Gus's, which was, we don't give a damn about keeping up with the Joneses, which was more along the lines of, we don't give a darn about keeping up with the Glenses. Um, that's Annie and John Glenn, the American superstar couple of the space age. You can't get more apple pie than Annie and John. They literally met in a playpen as toddlers in Ohio. And um, they are just, you know, both sprinkled with freckles, John Glenn sort of having that mad magazine kid's face, Annie to go with it. And um, Annie was really sort of the ultimate astro wife. Um, as the women soon learn, it's not only a mission about getting their husbands, you know, these grade A military test pilots who not only are picked for their piloting skills, but, you know, as some of the scientists say when they're picking the astronauts, there were some wild theories about what were going to happen to these men. Were their hearts going to stop in space? Were they 
never going to stop urinating, or is their blood pressure going to fall to zero? So they're sort of picked for being literally human cannonballs. Can they withstand it? And the wives, too, were actually investigated um, you know, by the FBI before the, the couples are announced. Um, Betty remembers some um, investigators coming over to her neighbor's home and asking questions about her. Well, does Mrs. Grissom cook home cooked meals every night? You know, do, she doesn't drink too much, does she? She doesn't have any communist leanings. Because all of a sudden, not only the astronauts, but the astro wives, as they're called in headlines, around the country are going to be dished up to the entire world as examples of, you know, the, the height of um, American family values. And these wives, at, you know, at probably the most stressful time to be an American housewife, the late 50s and early 60s, have to hold up this model of perfection. So overnight, they are transformed. And I almost think of them as America's first reality stars. Um, and really, it's like that because Life Magazine bought the rights to their exclusive personal stories for half a million dollars in 1959, which was a huge amount of money. And um, in, in uh, exchange for that, they were to allow reporters and photographers into their homes to just chronicle their day-to-day -day lives. What was it like to have your husband sitting on top of that rocket about to be blasted into space? So the women are sort of caught in this catch uh, 22, which is they're supposed to reveal who they are, but yet there's this a acute pressure to keep up with the Glenses, to be that model American housewife, and so they don't want to let out too much. Um, in fact, the book is being turned into a television show, which is going to air this summer on ABC. And just looking at um, some of the storylines, I mean, it's, it's very funny because um, one of the other wives of this group, Trudy Cooper, she was the only licensed pilot among the group, a very adventurous girl. Of course, you had to be an adventurous woman to be married to one of these guys who were testing in their early careers these high-performance experimental aircraft, and then to go where no man, of course, has ever gone, first into space, then to the moon. Um, Trudy Cooper, though, had had a little bit too much of the sort of Top Gun mentality and her husband Gordo sort of playing around on her. And so before he was picked as an astronaut, Gordo, he had to come sort of with his tail between his legs back to his wife saying, you know, Trudy, I have this amazing opportunity. I'm going to be picked as an astronaut. The only problem is they're not going to pick me if I don't have a wife. And we were just separated. And basically, they get back together for the sake of the space race. And they will later get divorced almost after Gordo's career is over. But those were the kind of details that the wives were very skittish about letting out as they're having this incredible um, public eye and spotlight shined in to their lives. So. The program starts out in Langley, Virginia. All of the families pack up and move to Virginia, and the men start training. And they're down in Cape Canaveral, of course, Florida. And one of the most interesting things I learned um, just starting out on the book was how the Cape, this sort of incredible men's playground down there where they were working hard but also playing hard, um, was a no-wives zone at first. Going to the Cape for a wife was totally off limits. They actually weren't allowed to go out um, where the rockets took off from. And for the early flights, all of the wives would watch from the beach. Um, at one point, Deke Sladen's wife, Marge, said, you know, this is ridiculous. You're going to, you know, be going into space. I can't go to the Cape. What's going on out there anyway? So she tells Deke that he better drive her out there, and he hides her under some blankets in the back of his car, and they go out past the, you know, military um, guards, and she gets out there and pops up her head. And, of course, it's just, you know, sort of a, a lonely beach jetty and some scrub brush and whatnot. Um, and she said the whole time she was just dying for a cigarette. But this was the kind of spunk and irreverence that these women bought brought to the